Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, AO Trauma North America Fireside Series for DRUJ Arthritis. Um, it's a pleasure to have you, and thank you for spending your evening with us. Uh, I'd like to thank Marco Rizzo for being chair and being the grand poobah and helping us all sort these things out and get the schedule going along with everyone back at the AO headquarters and uh, all the volunteers as well. This evening, uh, it's my pleasure, David Dennison. I'm uh, formerly from uh, Mayo Clinic for about 20 years now in the Mayo Clinic Health System. And I'll be joined by uh, Dr. Amit Gupta uh, from the University of Louisville, as well as uh, Philip Lazar uh, from Brigham and Women's in Boston and Janine Beasley uh, from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we'll be covering uh, our DRJ uh, arthritis section. Uh, please see here just for disclosures for the faculty, the content validation statement from AO North America. Uh, we'll start with um, my opening remarks course, the introduction, we'll start with a simple case and some basic um, evaluation and management. Uh, Dr. Gupta will talk about how I do it and lessons learned. We'll talk about complications and therapy, and then we'll try to get back for some discussion and um, just, uh, hopefully with some good questions from the audience as well. Here are the objectives for everyone. Um, hopefully we'll be able to help you identify radiographic indications for these surgical procedures understand the clinical criteria. I'll let you read through them, but um, we hope that this will be a stimulating uh, hour and um, hopefully you can develop some additional ideas about how to treat DRG arthritis. And finally, for 2024, the upcoming webinar is just to be aware of February 7th, May 1st, August 7th, and December 4th for scaphoid fractures, finger flaps, both bone form fracture and distal radius male union. <clears throat> Okay, and with that, uh, you'll also have access to the recording for YouTube within 24 hours. And this is also being uh, broadcast on orthotvonline.com. With that, we'll jump into it. My uh, role, <clears throat> excuse me, was really to just introduce the DRG arthritis. Um, I thought that what I would do is rather than do an exhaustive literature uh, report and things would be, a little bit of a commentary on the things I've learned after 20 years and um, hopefully some things that may help as far as sorting out some things before we kick it off to the bigger cases with uh, Dr. Gupta and uh, Dr. Blazer helping with figuring out how to fix all the things that don't work the first time. So I think uh, for my section, I just like everyone to understand how to look at the DRJ, understand the arthritis, be able to describe what the surgical treatment options may be and also define the expected outcome for those procedures and or if you're gonna go on to a salvage procedure so that you have a balanced ability to speak with your patients. Um, I can't do any DRJ talk without mentioning uh, what Dr. Berger taught all of us. And in, in this case, his pain, pain with instability or pain with arthrosis, we're already down to the bottom rung here, unfortunately, and we're dealing with something that has arthritis at the sigmoid notch maybe post-traumatic, infectious, inflammatory, OA, or maybe even developmental. And these often uh, can be associated with abnormal tendon exam as well, or tendon ruptures. So some things to consider. Even in this case with sigmoid notch arthritis, there's ulnar impaction, ulnar positive variants. So sometimes it's not always just osteoarthritis at the sigmoid notch. We do wanna confirm that the problem is the DRUJ. Uh, look out for these other things such as impaction or piezotriclectal arthritis perhaps look out for systemic or inflammatory arthritis or tenosynovitis. It's critical to understand if the DRJ is stable or unstable before treatment, and also understand what the hand function is. And again, I'm hallmarking it or highlighting uh, extensor tendon function in particular. And trying to confirm the location of the pain, sometimes it's a little more obvious. Sometimes uh, this was a patient I had that was a little bit more tricky. I thought, I'm like, well, this could be ulnar stylite impaction. And, ulnar impaction here in the lunate. And also he's got a very reverse sigmoid notch, which is associated with DRG arthritis as well. So sometimes we have to think about how we may sort this out from history or physical exam, the differences between loading exam or rotation pain, maybe imaging will help or even selective injections, or you may have to consider that your treatment option is gonna help you with several of these things more than just one. Uh, just an example here, imaging can be interesting to help see pain. This is someone who happened to come with an MRI. I find a couple things on this interesting. One is obviously the edema, the uh, fusion, and the as far as the arthritis, but there's also a really reverse sigmoid notch 
you might want to be interested in that if you're thinking about an implant arthroplasty. And also you can see how this is getting the usual thing, which is the EDQ, quite a bit of synovitis, and it's starting to rupture through there. So, and the ECU is subluxated as well. So certainly you don't have to get imaging like this, but it's interesting what you can see and correlate. Um, again, and uh, a bit of an homage to Dr. Berger, one of his classic sections, when you're looking at the sigmoid notch, I think you should consider that this is generally, hopefully, dish-shaped. We know that there's a difference in rotation, uh, or excuse me, a difference in the uh, radius for uh, the ulna and the sigmoid notch, so there is translation as well as rotation. And again, I think I have to say that uh, the distal ulna, we know, is a weight-bearing uh, uh, joint, and it's very critical to support the radius. So uh, Dr. Berger would always talk with us about, you really don't want to take that out unless it's really bad or it's arthritic. So again, none of us really want to get rid of it. It does quite a bit of support. Um, so I've said that. Thank you, Dick, for teaching me. Uh, the fifth compartment is also right here, the extensor compartment here. And I think that it's important to remember that this is the app, the main way to get into the DRUJ. Through the floor of the fifth, it leaves nice capsular flaps on either side for imbrication for if you do wind up doing a DARA or even any other procedure getting into the uh, dorsal aspect of the DRUJ. Um, the CT here, again, just a lip service to imaging can be helpful. This is, again, a very flat sigmoid notch. May not matter if you're going to put an aptus in, but if you're considering something like a U head, you might have some problems with stability. So it's good to, to have an idea what's going on in there. As far as exposure, <clears throat> as I mentioned from the axial views here, this is the avenue uh, to the, the DRJ for most of us through the fifth extensor compartment. It's a fairly easy exposure. You want to protect the sensory branch of the ulnar nerve, not release too far distally. And if you are going to preserve the dorsal radial ulnar ligament, make sure you carefully end your distal extent with your L capsulotomy. And thank you to Dr. Rizzo for uh, sharing this picture with me. I was a little bit short of a photo, so thanks, Marco. Um, so I'm going to introduce a case quickly, and then we'll talk about some things and then come back to the treatment. This was an 80-year-old gentleman, a uh, very nice man, travels the world in his retirement. He has a little bit of pain, not too much, but he came in because his small finger and ring finger had a droop to them. They, he could not extend them. He does not have inflammatory disease. He does not have translocation of the lunate. Um, I would uh, reference uh, Glulus ratio. If you can come up the sigmoid notch and 50% of the lunate is on the radius, generally not a problem. Uh, he does not have radiocarpal arthritis and his excellent flexion extension of his wrist. And his elbow is normal in pronation, supination, and as far as it's not limiting him, and he has good flexion extension, and there's no concern for a, a nerve problem. His extensor tendon seems to be the issue for his drooping fingers. So please just uh, hang on to him for just a second. We'll come back in a minute. As far as treatment options in general for a patient like this, we may try injections or splinting, try to limit rotation. <clears throat> Certainly, we try a lot of neurectomies or nerve blocks to see if that's enough. Um, I think that's OK if the tendons are fine. You can try all sorts of things. Um, we will sometimes use an ultrasound to evaluate the tendons if there's concern. I've had several patients where the EDQ is gone, and we really don't do too much unless it starts bothering the EDC. But um, you have to decide how you want to manage that. But tendon ruptures can also direct treatment, so look out for them as well. Once we have pain with arthrosis, the third rung in Dr. Berger's um, algorithm, we, we really have to come down to some form of a resection or an implant arthroplasty or to consider some form so that we would have either a DARA or you could have a Bowers or a U-head, for example, or an Aptus. Or uh, an SK may be something to consider. And an SK is kind of nice because it also preserves the wrist, a little bit of a shelf for the lunate. It also preserves the diameter of the wrist a little bit. Um, this is another slide that I, I really did uh, bother Marco for because having been in the hallway with him for 20 years, I really adapted what he was doing with SKs, uh, trying to minimize, uh, if you look at this uh, publication here from 2006, it's really just trying to do a nice SK uh, one screw and one pin is pretty easy to do. Two screws, I think, is a little more tricky if you're going to have a smaller ulnar piece and you're trying to minimize the distance from the ulna to the stump. This suggests that under 35 millimeters may be a little bit more stable, perhaps it, whether it preserves some ECU subsheath or however. Um, you want to make sure you have, we were talking about this earlier, uh, you know, too little, maybe you get HO. Uh, too much, you might get instability. So just a nice reference if you'd like to look at that. And uh, Dr. Gupta has some, I'm sure, lots of comments about this coming up shortly as well. 
when we get to our surgical options, uh, we should expect them to improve pain and increase pronation and supination. Um, resection, we know, leads to convergence. This is fortunately not always symptomatic, and I would say it's less commonly symptomatic as well, fortunately. Adara is favored probably for a little bit older or less active adults and can be associated with weak grip, um, but it's fairly simple. The survey capangi is perhaps better for younger patients and may protect the wrist. It may be better if there's an absent TFCC or if there's concern about supporting the lunate. And a Bowers is a little bit better if you can repair or have the TFCC to help provide some stability. Um, we'll come back to these other positions through the talk, hopefully with time. And then if you go down to arthroplasty, in general, we're really looking at an, either an ulnar head uh, arthroplasty or a semi-constrained implant. Another way just to look at this really quickly is if you're going down the resection uh, pathway here, again, you should expect to improve rotation and pain. Again, you have to decide which of these you want to choose. Uh, also keep in mind, if you do have a rheumatoid patient, SK might be harder due to the, um, the bone quality, for example. However, all these may wind up in, with a, an issue with either instability of the stump or convergence and pain that you may have to deal with. And then you have to have a, a way out from that. We'll talk about that towards the end. Uh, for arthroplasty, again, you should expect improved rotation and pain. Uh, you have to deal with implant stability, subsidence, uh, prominence of the hardware. For example, an aptus is very specific about where it is situated and the size you use. And of course, you always potentially are looking at a revision with an implant. So we'll talk about a lot of these this evening. Uh, what will you do? Uh, most people probably do what you saw in training or what you're comfortable with. Um, there's fortunately the data suggests there's really not anything that's particularly better, which is good, but hopefully you can try to match the the best evidence with uh, the patient and the age and the activity level. I would suggest to be careful of the unstable and arthritic DREJ because they can be, uh, if you do a DR and it's very unstable, you should be trying to stabilize that. Beware of radiocarpal arthritis and or uh, translocation of the carpus. Obviously, we have to consider whether we need to be doing something at the radiocarpal joint or associated procedures for the uh, wrist itself or stabilization of the ulna. So with that, we're back to uh, my patient. He is 80, uh, super nice guy. Uh, we did a fairly basic, uh, we did a dorsal exposure in the midline, but worked over to the fifth compartment. We elevated flaps, as I showed you on the initial anatomy image. We tried to maintain as much capsular flap as possible. We debrided this, the, removed the distal ulna, shaped this to the proximal edge of the sigmoid notch. And then we completed a tendon transfer and repair, which I won't go into too much detail we tried to keep this as robust and simple and distal as possible to minimize any scarring around the wrist. Once the tendon transfer was repaired with tenodesis to check it uh, intraoperatively as he was not awake at this time, we then went ahead with neutral rotation with the wrist, uh, excuse me, with the elbow flexed. And then we do an imbrication with two otichron of the capsule and maintain a Munster splint for four to six weeks. Uh, this does cause some trouble with trying to maintain uh, the best rehabilitation for the tendon, but uh, we have found and we were taught back at Mayo pretty much to do uh, that type of uh, imbrication and, and protection afterwards, which I think is uh, reasonable. Um, there's lots of ways to stabilize that, which we, I just don't have time to go into, but we'll come back to that. But I think the, the point being for this gentleman uh, who's 80, who had that problem, this is probably a fairly, hopefully typical result. It's not perfect. He cannot extend completely, but he is not drooping his ring and small finger. His donors fortunately have worked pretty well um, he's happy with this. He doesn't have pain. And you can see it's a little floppy in his pronation and supination, but overall, um, he's satisfied with this. And I think it's a reasonable um, procedure for uh, this gentleman and his activity level. I'll just let you see his pronation and supination. He's a little bit floppy, but uh, he's not, fortunately, not really unstable. So I will stop with that. Hopefully, that's just a brief introduction to what your appetite about what's next. Um, so my take home messages are really try to make sure that the history, pain, imaging, and exam makes sense to you and that the procedure you're thinking about makes sense. Uh, you really need to have a good discussion with the patient, try to match expectations and provide a reliable procedure and be prepared for pitfalls and the need for revision. And with that, um, I will move on to Dr. Uh, Gupta, who's gonna take us through some wonderful cases. Uh Dave, uh, before we do that, we had a, uh, a question that you might want to address, and some audience members may be interested in that. And so uh, one of the attendees uh, uh, asked, why capsular invocation in neutral rotation instead of in supination? 
great question. Yeah, so um, we tended to, uh, you know, if you have resected that, it's harder to say if that position is really going to be. I know we talk about positions um, for stabilizing the DRJ for after DRJ injuries or distorted fractures, for example. Uh, we were kind of taught just in general that if you can stabilize it in neutral, um, it's not bad. Sort of the radius is sitting on top of the ulna, hopefully. Uh, in addition, we really never wanted to. I've never seen a supination contracture with a DARA myself. But for other ones, we never wanted a supination contracture. So we tended to sit neutral to maybe a degree or two of supination and work from there rather than uh, risk for a supination contracture. I I haven't seen that with a DARA, but I've seen patients that have been pinned in supination for distal raised fractures that have had supination contractures, and we really tried to avoid those. So our teaching was neutral, and uh, it's worked well for me. So that's just you know my two cents, but... And I'll stop. I, I agree. I, I agree. I think the tendency to uh, uh, immobilize in supination or uh, think about uh, uh, holding the forearm in supination largely comes from difficulty restoring that after distal radius fracture, which is, you know, the mechanics are obviously very different when the ulnar head is gone and much of the soft tissue attachments are not there to the native ulna. So, so I think the stability is is a different issue. Super. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and share the screen here. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, <clears throat> some aspects of distal radial and joint arthritis and reconstruction. So I'll present my first case. This is a 53-year-old carpenter, uh, and he also plays the guitar. Uh, he was involved in a very bad motorcycle accident in uh, May of this year. Uh, and his motorcycle hit a deer. And he had a very bad distal radius fracture, which involved the sigmoid notch. He was treated elsewhere with uh, ORIF of distal radius. So when he presented to us, uh, he had pain and stiffness in his wrist. Um, he had pain on pronation, supination, and he had very, uh, he had a lot of uh, clicking on supination. He was very uncomfortable. He could not work. His wrist range of motion was uh, barely present. He had 20 degrees of flexion, 20 degrees of extension, and he had loss of um, EPL. So his EPL was non-functional. So he was pretty um, miserable, couldn't work. Um, so what we did was, um, so this is his, uh, uh, his initial uh, trauma um, uh, uh, x-rays, and as you can see, very comminuted uh, intraarticular um, fracture of the distal radius involving the sigmoid area. And you see that uh, it's quite shattered uh, distal radius. So he had this treated uh, elsewhere. Um, and uh, this is the treatment that he had received and his distal radius had completely healed. Um, so when he came to us, um, his uh, so CT scan, as you can see, his uh, articular surface of the radiocarpal joint is completely destroyed. Uh, and he had um, obviously a lot of pain from this. And um, so artic articular surface here is completely destroyed. So we have to do something about it. And here on his uh, sigmoid also, and his, uh, his sigmoid is destroyed and he has very a lot of clicking uh, and painful uh, attempt at pronation supination. So at this point, what I did was I removed his plate and screws from his left wrist, uh, did a radio scaphoelunate arthrodesis. Uh, I tend to excise the distal pole of the scaphoid and also excise the triquetrum so that you can get a better uh, radial ulnar deviation. Um, and then we, at the same time, we did EIP to EPL transfer. And uh, then to um, address the DREJ, we did a DREJ replacement with uh, a Shecker implant. So this Shecker implant is actually uh, constrained or semi-constrained implant. We have a plate on the radius. This is fixed with uh, uh, locking and unlocking screws onto the radius. There's a uh, stem which goes into the radius itself. And then there is a uh, large stem, intermodulary stem, which goes into the ulna and has a plastic ball on top which rotates. Um, and um, there's a housing uh, device which screws into the radial plate. And this maintains this. The ball rotates in this, uh, in the, inside this. Um, there is a um, extension of the ball, which uh, it, when it protrudes in supination extension, as you know, in 
pronation, the ulna is a little longer. So that that um, that movement is taken care of in this uh, design. So this um, is, uh, you know, Louis Shekhar was my partner. So we've been using this for many years and I've had very good results with this. So um, this is what uh, we did, radius K fulunate arthrodesis and, um, you know, um, got a good, nice mid carpal joint here. So what I do is I, I go for the dorsal incision uh, on these um, and then we make a small incision on the volar aspect of the scaphoid, just like you do a scaphoid exposure. And then you can expose the distal pole of the scaphoid. And I take out the distal pole of the scaphoid. Then I put a guide wire from the distal pole of the scaphoid because you're looking at it. And um, I put the guide wire from uh, a radial, um, volar radial to dorsal um, ulnar uh, part of the radius. So this, then I put a screw across it. It's a headless screw. And then I take out the triquetrum here, and then I put a, a guide wire from the dorsal ulnar to a volar radial onto the radius, and then I put a. So they're all indwelling, so they are compressing and indwelling. And this, and I put, um, you know, whatever um, bone I take out from the scaphoid and from the triquetrum, I put it in the gap. So this works for me as a good way of doing a, a radius scaphoid lunar fusion. All the uh, hardware is inside the bones. Then at the, uh, I did a uh, uh, EIP to EPL transfer, and then we did a Shekhar prosthesis. And this guy actually regained um, very good pronation, supination, almost full. He had 40-40 uh, in terms of his uh, flexion extension arc, and uh, he went back to his work. This is his uh, result. As you can see, it's very important to get this alignment correct. Uh, one of the things that I'll point out in, in the method is how to get that alignment correct of this when you're doing this implant. So procedures performed today for replacement uh, um, or for DREJ um, is DARA. DARA has been around for many years, since 1912. Suave Kapanji, you heard Dr. Denison talk about it. It uh, fuses the distal ulna to the radius and does a, creates a pseudoarthrosis slightly proximal to that so you can get rotation. This was described a long time ago in the 30s. Bowers described hemiresection, uh, Kirk Watson described a match resection, and uh, Scott Wolf and others describe wide resection of the of the ulna or uh, ultra short dara. But however, whenever you take out these um, distal ulna in a person who is loading the joint, and it's it always helps to look at X-rays in this position rather than are used to it like this, you know. So if you look at it this position, there is a uh, load bearing. So the distal radial ulna joint is a part of a bigger joint system, which as uh, Hagar pointed out, that proximal and distal radial ulnar joint form two parts of one joint system. So there is loading and that what happens is the radius and the ulna will come together. It causes radio ulnar impingement and that's what causes the pain. And uh, Louis Shecker and uh, Vivian Lees were able to do this with the load bearing x-rays and they were able to show that just by loading the uh, x-rays, taking the x-ray in this plane, that you can uh, show that the radius and the ulna come together. It doesn't matter what has been done. It's Swava Kapanji, uh, Dara, uh, tendon stabilization, whatever. The radius and the ulna will come together and it causes uh, radial ulnar impingement. Even if you do ultra short Dara, the stump will uh, invariably come together between the radius and the ulna. So the ulna head is critical for both weight bearing and forearm motion. So you have the force of of gravity, you have axial loading, and you have the muscle action, and you need a stabilization of the distal radial ulnar joint uh, to uh, to provide that. And many people have tried different things, like silicone has been tried, metal implants, ceramic implants like Herbert, and these are the this is the list of all the um, uh, type of devices that are uh, that have been tried. Unfortunately, most of this are off the market uh, in the United States, at least. Um, so we have very few choices. So the replacement in any case in the distal radial ulnar joints needs an intrinsic stability. You have to provide full pronation supination, uh, provide for the normal radial migration. As I mentioned before, there should be a variable angle of rotation and weight lifting capability. And I think this device uh, uh, provides that. And um, it looks big and it's uh, constrained or semi-constrained, but in, in my experience, it really works well. Now, why not Dara? Well, Dara described this uh, long ago, just excising the distal pole of the 
uh, rate uh, of the ulna, distal part of the ulna. And as you can see, when it uh, it will come together, people have tried to stabilize the end stump using ECU, FCU, and all the, the uh, soft tissue reconstruction. Um, but what happens is this is this is a patient who had a uh, Dara done, which was stabilized with the ECU and FCU, and uh, it became painful because it was impinging, the radius and the ulna were impinging. So um, this patient uh, came in this situation, and as you can see, load-bearing x-ray shows that, load-bearing films uh, through cross-table um, uh, x-rays show that the radius and ulna are coming together. So what we did was we did a, decided to do a um, uh, uh, chakra prosthesis. And as you can see here, you have to align the um, radial plate very nicely. And it helps to excise the distal part of the, the volar part of the radius on the sigmoid notch, volar part of the sigmoid notch, so that you can get a proper alignment of the, of the radius. Otherwise, it faces, it tends to tilt it and face in a different direction. And you want it completely lateral uh, on this film. So once you've done that, once you've got the uh, fixation there, then you can put the screws in and then you um, uh, put in a stem of the ulna. This ulna stem has to be the uh, biggest stem, biggest size stem that you can uh, fit into that. And then you put in the uh, plate and screws and here it is uh, a, 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 in this uh, failed Dara, we put in this uh, uh, implant and here's the patient. She's gone about, uh, I say four years, five years now. And she's very happy. She lives out of state and comes and visits us from time to time. So this is a this is a case that uh, <clears throat> um, you know I have described two cases that we have been able to deal with it uh, in a fairly functional uh, outcome. So I'll stop here and um, we'll uh, take any questions or uh, go ahead with uh, Dr. Blaze's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it, I <clears throat> had to ask you one. Uh, how about uh, just for tips for people putting in the radial plate? Um, we were also taught to make sure it, it tended to be as uh, if the volar part of the plate or the most palmar part of the plate would be basically even with the volar part of the radius, as opposed to in the middle, for example, or higher. Um, obviously, like you said, if you take away that sigmoid notch, you can make sure that the ulnar side of the implant is not going to rotate up under the ECU or the extensor tendons, but uh, and also sizing the plate. But I presume you also look like on your x-ray, you also have the plate kind of slid as palmer as you could on the radius. Do you do the same? I do. I um, One of the things is that you have to get a very good exposure because, they, you know, the um, rate, uh, you're always fighting the ulna. And if you're constantly fighting the ulna and not a, uh, you haven't done enough release, then it'll it'll throw you off. So you have to get that sigmoid and also the ulnar part of the radius nicely released and also exposed properly so that your ulna is out of the way. And then you take out the volar portion of the sigmoid so that your, your radial plate is fitting nicely. And then once you're happy that it's completely lateral, uh, that's when you put the uh, uh, definitive radial plate on. Uh, and, and then you take it from there. And then you have to... Um, ream the ulna and put in an ulna stem uh, and make sure that the ball is nicely in the socket in the in that in the appropriate uh, area. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think I can do it without a saw anymore to get that right. spot flat. So <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, saw is very important, or you can use a burr, but I use the saw. Thank you. Great cases. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll continue on with uh, Dr. Blazer. He's going to help us with uh, some of the other procedures that we were talking about in the beginning in particular. So take it away, Phil. Thanks, uh, uh, Dave, Amit, and everyone uh, for their attention. Um, my, uh, my charge tonight is to review some of the complications of these uh, uh, procedures. Um, uh, so let's jump in and, and talk about surgical complications. Uh, learning objectives. Uh, so really, uh, the focus uh, for my 15 minutes here is going to be uh, to have a better sense of what the common complications are for these common DRUJ procedures and some of the uncommon ones, and then be able to consider and execute some of the solutions to these complications. So I'm going to start out with a case of mine that 
um, did not go well. This is DS, a uh, 55-year-old woman presented to me uh, after three prior uh, surgeries to address ulnar-sided wrist pain. And I think this is not unusual. Some of these folks with ulnar-sided wrist pain ended up, unfortunately, needing multiple interventions. And she had had an arthroscopy, a metaphyseal shortening, um, uh, and then removal of hardware uh, uh, by uh, a surgeon, hoping that uh, the residual hardware was uh, her problem. Uh, she did have a history of diabetes and hypothyroidism, as well as an active smoker. And I think you can see from her radiograph here that uh, she has a pretty florid uh, non-union of her ulnar head after this attempted metaphyseal shortening. Uh, because of non-union, she had an MRI and a CT, uh, which did not suggest infection, uh, but indicated that her uh, plain radiographs underestimated the amount of DRUJ degenerative change. Uh, and so given that she was lower demand, um, tobacco uh, use and diabetes, I thought that she might uh, do well with a distal ulnar resection, uh, so-called DARA, as you can see here. But unfortunately, uh, she never got very uh, good pain relief. And a couple of years after her DARA, she returned to see me with continued ulnar-sided wrist pain, which she identified particularly with rotation and lifting any significant weight and wondered what else we could do for her. So just, just to review, and, and I thought uh, uh, maybe the diagrams would also help uh, uh, for some of the folks who are less uh, facile with uh, these surgeries. Um, uh, what we've talked about before, the, the four main uh, types of surgeries that are uh, done, I think, for DRUJ arthritis include the DARA, the distal ulnar resection, uh, as depicted here, where the entire ulnar head and styloid are removed. And so the TFCC components are no longer in continuity with the uh, remainder of the ulna. The so-called hemi-resection, diagrammatically depicted here as a Bowers, hoping to maintain some soft tissue attachments of the TFCC onto the ulnar styloid and hence into the ulnar shaft. Uh, and the suave capanji with arthrodesis of the uh, radius and ulna across the sigmoid notch with the TFC components uh, re uh, remaining distally and then creation of a pseudoarthrosis uh, arthrosis uh, proximity, and then, of course, uh, implant arthroplasty. Um, um, and so when we drill down into the literature on these various operations, uh, uh, needless to say, there are multiple papers on all of these. Uh, the vast majority of them are retrospective. Um, uh, and I'm going to focus on some of the recent publications or highlight them because uh, there is sort of a, a general theme across these. Um, uh, and complications, unfortunately, for all of these procedures are not uncommon. And so uh, Virheil uh, in 2021 in hand published a paper comparing with the same methodology, same group, same surgeons across a wide uh, health system, turns out to be uh, our system in Boston, compared DARA and the Suave Kapanji. For the DARA in particular, they identified a 30% complication rate, uh, ulnar stump instability, which Dr. Gupta has um, pointed out to us, really isn't instability so much of the ulnar stump. It's impingement of the radius and ulna, particularly with loading, uh, occurred in about one in eight of the patients. And while of their patients in this series, uh, about 20% of them had some type of stabilization of the ulna, uh, with either the ECU or the FCU, uh, uh, part of each tendon, or actually some of both, uh, they did not uh, notice that tendon stabilization actually uh, uh, statistically diminished the tendency towards ulnar stump instability. Um, uh, the second most uh, common uh, complication that they saw in their series were actually problems with the dorsal ulnar cutaneous nerve, uh, almost one in 10 of the patients had that, and they did not uh, record uh, some early transient paresthesias. These were people with either persistent uh, paresthesia in the ulnar cutaneous distribution that either resolved or patients who developed neuromas and neuromas in continuity uh, uh, as well. And again, a uh, reminder, uh, diagrammatically, the DARA and then an image of a patient uh, uh, post-distal uh, ulnar uh, resection or DARA. Uh, so 
the same group uh, uh, looked at Suave Kapanji, and again, diagrammatically here on the far side of the screen, uh, and here's a patient of mine uh, with a Suave Kapanji with two, in this case, headed cannulated screws. Uh, and I agree with Dr. Dennison's comments that, that there's not a whole lot of room if you're going to keep it uh, within that uh, 35 millimeters from the end of the ulna uh, that uh, the previous article referenced. Uh, but sometimes you can uh, fit a couple of small screws in. Um, uh, and anyway, the, the Verhal uh, paper uh, also reported a 50% complication rate. With the numbers available in this series, this was not statistically significantly different from the DARA, uh, but certainly uh, a not uh, infrequent uh, problem. Uh, the SK, uh, Swabe Kapanji, does introduce the potential problem of heterotopic ossification at the pseudoarthrosis, which they saw in about 18%, and actually about 1 in 10 or 11% of their patients came to a secondary surgery for that heterotopic ossification. Uh, and that can be uh, among those 18% that was identified as either a significant radiographic phenomena, uh, a problem limiting uh, forearm rotation, which is typically quite uh, well-preserved after a suave capanchi, or even leading to a complete re or the establishment essentially of a one-bone forearm, which certainly uh, I've had one of my patients develop that and had to go back and uh, reintroduce or re uh, resect the ulna. Uh, likewise, so-called stump instability or radial ulna convergence, they identified at a slightly lesser rate than the DARA at 7%, uh, and dorsal only cutaneous nerve or sensory nerve uh, problems were identified um, in about 11% of their uh, patients, so similar numbers. Uh, uh, because the Suave Kapanji did include the introduction of hardware, uh, typically uh, uh, some type of screw, uh, they did have among their secondary surgeries a uh, removal of hardware rate of uh, 14%. Uh, a similar uh, retrospective review was published the same year in hand, looking at the uh, hemi resection of the distal ulna and uh, diagrammatically um, and uh, by uh, descriptors. Uh, there are a couple of variations on this, uh, as uh, Dr. Gupta mentioned. Uh, diagrammatically, I think this represents uh, the operation uh, described as a hemi resection and interposition or a Bowers operation, where essentially the articular cartilage is uh, uh, removed and the underlying bone only. Uh, Kirk Watson's operation, the matched distal ulna resection, I think is diagrammatically represented here, uh, which involves removal of the a uh, similar amount of bone to what Dr. Bowers removed, but then some additional uh, metaphyseal and even diaphyseal bone. Um, and different uh, authors will do um, uh, interposition uh, in different ways after doing these. Uh, now, Najin and I'll uh, reported on this in 2021. The complication rate was somewhat lower at only around 14%, but about 8% of this group went on to a secondary uh, surgery. Interestingly enough, their series of hemi resections was biased towards patients with inflammatory arthritis, and overall their results uh, were better. Uh, but nevertheless, they did have uh, uh, a number of uh, complications. Stylo uh, carpal impingement, and remember, with these operations, the ulnar styloid is left intact, as is the uh, as are the components of the TFCC pointed out diagrammatically with the green arrow here. So uh, impingement of the styloid against the carpus, particularly if the ulna collapses towards the radius, as uh, Dr. Gupta uh, mentioned, which is uh, theoretically somewhat limited by the additional soft tissue stability, but certainly not eliminated. Um, uh, so stylocarpal impingement was seen in 6%. Wound problems were uh, similar in frequency at around 6% and about 5% of their patients did undergo a revision surgery with conversion to uh, resection of the entirety of the ulnar head or a DARA uh, operation being the most common uh, secondary surgery performed in this series. 
when we get into uh, implants, uh, uh, in addition to the potential complications that can occur with any surgery on the other part of the wrist, uh, we also, uh, uh, each implant has its own uh, characteristic profile of prosthesis uh, complications. And while I think much of the literature is quite positive, the group in Seattle with uh, Dr. Hanel published uh, a series of uh, just over 50 of these with medium term follow up about five years ago. And their group identified uh, really a, a sizable uh, number of different complications, but about 30% uh, of the group ended up having a revision surgery. Uh, and I think the uh, introduction of an implant while solving some of the problems that Dr. Gupta got into also introduces new categories of potential complication. And this is essentially a total joint arthroplasty of the DRUJ. So some of the complications which uh, one sees with total joints and other areas can, can occur. And just as an example of this, this is a case my partner, Dr. George Dyer, shared with me to illustrate this. Uh, this is an individual who had an aptus Schecker prosthesis, and you can see the, uh, uh, the ulnar uh, component here uh, is outlined. If we look at the subsequent x-ray at about a year, uh, it is concerning. Um, uh, for loosening, and if you uh, drill down into that x-ray, you can see that the uh, ulna stem is uh, windshield wipering within, within the ulna. Uh, so getting back to uh, my patient, DS, who I started out with, um, uh, just the slide reviews her history, and I think she did have radial ulnar stump impingement. I did elect uh, uh, to treat her surgically, and there are a number of operations uh, that are out there uh, uh, to address the so-called failed DARA. Uh, there are a number of soft tissue reconstructions. The two uh, that I have the most experience with include one described by Bill Kleiman in the mid-90s, and then subsequently one described by Dr. Dean Satirianos about a decade ago. And this is an image from uh, his uh, technique as uh, Dr. Gupta mentioned for the Schecker prosthesis, uh, this operation, you do need a fairly wide exposure, not only of the distal ulna marked here with U, but the radius, which is behind A. A here is a large allograft Achilles tendon rolled up into a ball, and the Achilles tendon allograft is secured uh, to the ulnar aspect of the radius and the radial aspect of the ulna over a significant distance, as you can see, with a series of sutures or suture anchors um, uh, to uh, provide some stability and to provide a not innervated large soft tissue cushion in between the two bones to try and diminish that radial ulnar contact and impingement. But as Dr. Gupta mentioned, uh, people have talked about doing longer distal ulnar resections, um, uh, you know, sort of an extended DARA, if you like. Uh, and likewise, others have talked about lengthening the ulnar step, uh, excuse me, the ulnar stump, as well as implant arthroplasty. Um, uh, and here is a, an image of a uh, so-called long DARA or long distal ulnar uh, resection uh, in this individual. Uh, so for DS, uh, like uh, one of the cases we talked about earlier, I elected to use the aptus Schecker implant. Um, uh, we've talked about a couple of the technical points. Um, uh, I, I think the distal end of the radial prosthesis should be proximal to the carpus, as you can see uh, depicted here on the intraoperative fluoro image. And, and I want to second uh, Dr. Gupta's point that the ulna is in your way and it is quite easy to get the radial component malpositions such that it is tilted and not pointing towards the lateral or first dorsal compartment uh, surface of the radius. And, and that is the position that you uh, want it in. And when you have it in that position, uh, the, the sort of uh, 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 block here to uh, demonstrate where the definitive prosthesis should go. You place the definitive prosthesis um, uh, and then the ulnar head and then the two are assembled as, as we saw earlier. Uh, 
Uh, and here is my patient's uh, first postoperative radiograph. Um, and uh, here uh, she presents at uh, two months post-op. Um, and you can see she uh, does not quite have full supination, but really quite reasonable. Likewise, not quite full pronation, uh, but also quite reasonable. And more importantly, her pain diminished uh, significantly in her DASH score at two months, uh, decreased from 79 to 47. Much of what she complained to me at that visit actually involved paresthesia and her median nerve distribution. So some of this may be related to carpal tunnel, which uh, she may have an, uh, an opportunity to have her sixth operation on her wrist uh, in the not too distant future. Um, and so uh, complications of DRUJ procedures uh, include uh, those that, uh, for arthritis at the DRUJ, those that occur with uh, ulnar sided wrist surgery for any indication, including those of the dorsal and their sensory nerve, uh, for most of the bony resection procedures, which are successful in relieving pain for a lot of our patients. Stump instability is an unsolved problem and remains a problem for some of these patients uh, with whatever operation uh, one chooses. Uh, to address that, there are many soft tissue stabilization techniques uh, that one can consider, uh, but also implant arthroplasty, I think, does uh, certainly have a role here uh, uh, for managing uh, stump instability in particular. And and we may want to get into uh, when is the indication to do uh, implant arthroplasty as the primary operation rather than as a salvage, which uh, I think is a lot of the experience that is out there in terms of the literature and uh, many people in terms of the use of the semi-constrained uh, prosthesis um, uh, for DRUJ instability. Um, so thanks for everyone's attention. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, that's quite a bit to cover. Thank you very much. Um, great to have your expertise and put a spin on that so we can everybody can think about what they're going to do next. Um, I think we'll move on um, to for, uh, to Janine Beasley, and uh, we'll hear a bit more about how to manage some of these non-operatively. And of course, you guys are the 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 reason we get any good results. So thank you. Well, thank you for your kind words. Um, and again, I hope I can shed some light on um, these patients in regards to managing them uh, in regards to therapy. I, I want to, I, I hope that I can show you some orthotic devices or some splints that decrease pain because that's the big issue with these patients, uh, non-operatively, pre-operatively, and sometimes, unfortunately, post-operatively. And we also have some modalities that have been demonstrated to be very effective and uh, to talk a little bit about what to do post-operatively. So we know that, especially with the distal radial ulnar joint with rheumatoid arthritis, the soft tissues are compromised and you need a stable pain-free wrist <laughs> to do most of your activities of daily living. And that's really quite an issue with our rheumatoid arthritic patients. As you know, the, the, the radius and ulna, the, there's issues here and uh, trying to provide stability with all these implants that you've shown, all these surgeries that you've shown. Um, and we in therapy try to, to do it with an orthosis. Um, uh, and and uh, one way to do it is with uh, uh, a little bit of pressure on the ulna and radius, which can provide a little bit of stability to the, to the ulna. So um, as we, let me just show you with this video, um, uh, so if you have a patient who has a, a lot of pressure, at, uh, pain at the distal ulna, and you kind of cradle the hand, uh, putting pressure on the distal ulna and, and the radius with an orthosis, uh, some of those patients can get a lot of pain relief. And they're short little, little splints that don't cross the wrist, and they find them very effective in getting back to their uh, activities of daily living. There's a million ways you can do this. You can put little padding in almost any uh, orthosis, um, again, right at the ulna, and then another one at the, at the radius to kind of uh, support these two structures with this. And, and patients really, really like this, and it's been very helpful in decreasing their pain, especially 
uh, with pronation and supination. And this has really been supported in li literature. Um, the, the panel's been talking about uh, weight bearing. Uh, this article in the Journal of Hand Therapy demonstrated that uh, with a very, very similar orthosis, patients had um, uh, an increased weight bearing capacity. You don't think of the upper extremities with weight bearing, but you know, getting in and out of a chair, um, there's a lot of weight bearing <laughs> with the uh, upper extremity. And here, another article uh, with, a, again, a very similar uh, padding at the distal ulna. Um, it actually decreased pain 52%, increased grip strength, and um, increased uh, active forearm rotation. So it's just a nice tool to have in your toolbox, uh, a little bit of padding. I had a, I saw, I was able to see a patient very early with a, uh, a rare condition called still disease. And uh, she had a lot of pain at her wrist, as you know, which is kind of a hallmark of that uh, condition. And uh, it, she was able to really go back to a lot of her activities with this modification to her existing orthosis. So we as hand therapists, do a lot with joint protection. There's a lot of studies, especially with, with the rheumatoid population, uh, to support the effectiveness of joint protection programs and decreasing pain and um, increasing activities of daily living. So we're, we're not just making orthotics. We're, we're looking at the whole patient, to instructing them in joint protection. Um, paraffin has been shown to be very helpful, really low cost. Um, and um, in decreasing pain and stiffness with these rheumatoid patients. And also a pulsed ultrasound for rheumatoid arthritis might be another thing that you, uh, you would wanna attempt as a therapist, uh, decreasing pain, swelling, um, and increasing grip strength. So we've had all these uh, discussions about uh, the surgery. And uh, so postoperatively, what do you do? What happens as uh, if you're um, seeing these patients? Well. Typically, they come out of a bulky dressing and go into a short arm cast um, during anywhere between weeks zero to six. Now, that's going to depend on how, how the soft tissues look, what's going on. Is it rheumatoid? Is it not rheumatoid? Uh, very few patients are going to go into, oh, sorry, here we go, a wrist orthosis uh, because most of the time you're going to want to limit pronation and supination. And you can do this with a long arm uh, splint. Um, but if you do that, you're going to limit elbow motion, which is um, not a lot of fun for the, for the uh, patient. And so you may want to consider a sugar tong orthosis or a Munster orthosis. Um, you're also going to do digit active range of motion, avoid heavy lifting. Um, and you're going to wait on that as a rule of thumb weight on pronation and supination until about week four with many of these surgeries, it may be longer. And really you, um, I think the best way to look at this is the therapist and the surgeon having the conversation saying, okay, it moves very easily, let's wait, or it's getting stiff, let's go ahead as we make that decision when to start pronation and supination. Um, edema and scar management are done, of course. And then we're going to we're going to take a, anywhere between the week six and twelve, looking at how it's moving, looking at the pain to determine when to wean out of that orthosis, when to start those light activities, and to really delay passive range of motion. You know, cranking on these is not going to get them better fa faster. They need um, to be pain free. Um, a little fabrication tip for the therapists in the audience: as you know, these sugar tong orthoses are kind of a lot of material to mess with. Um, and so here, a Munster orthosis, this is just a, a nice, um, I use with permission from um, Deb Schwartz, um, just one of the one of the best orthotic fabricators, I believe, around. And gravity helps you make this, this orthosis, a little Velcro tab in the back. You're gonna limit pronation and supination, but you're gonna have that nice elbow flexion and extension. So I know you surgeons like to look at your surgeries, but we therapists like to show our splints. So please uh, be patient with us. So here um, we have, uh, again, our summary is gonna be the uh, different orthoses. We have joint protection modalities. Here's my students at Grand Valley State University with their very first wrist orthosis that they made. They're kind of proud of that as you're 
um, as you know, and, and these are my reference. But I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, tonight and to also, um, uh, you know, add the therapist to this panel because I do believe that it's this communication that's really important. So, great. Thanks, Jean. Thank you very, very much. I think we'd all agree that um, you can't be a hand surgeon without making, uh, I don't know, a dozen trips across the hall, hopefully to the hand therapy lab each day. So thank you for <laughs> all the extra time and effort. Um, so uh, just for the folks, we still have a pretty good number of people that have ha are hanging in there. Uh, we have a, about 15 more minutes to go over some things. I, I would say if you do have questions, we certainly have time to take them if you have anything you want to send in. Um, hey, Dave, while, while the yes, audience sir. is starting, I, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, and for a meet, <laughs> if you do a, a if you do a suave kapanji, are you doing uh, any type of soft tissue stabilization uh, 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 across the pseudoarthrosis? Amit, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, I do. I I use the um, I've not published this, but I've I've used the FCU. I put, put the full uh, full FCU down the uh, medullary canal or ECU down the medullary canal and tie it up at the top of the suave capanji. It's, it's, it's harder to get in because you just have to make a big hole in the proximal and distal part. And then you just uh, bring out the two stumps and then tie it in the proximal part of the ulna. So that it, it, it prevents the, I think it prevents a little bit of the radial ulnar impingement. But you use the whole ECU. Yeah, whole ECU, yeah. Dave, what do you do? Um, so I have to say, I don't have the world's experience on that, but I would say if I'm done and it's stable, I'm not doing anything. And if it's really concerning me, I'd probably use a strip of the ECU myself. Not, I'm not sure I take the whole thing. I like having the little bit of that wall potentially, I guess maybe, but, um, I, I think it's to your point. I think if it's, um, you know, if you're getting done and it's really all over the place, it's not a good feeling. And a splint alone is not usually going to help you out. I think, uh, is that what your experience has been too? Uh, yeah, I, I, I do. Like it, uh, I, I think I do what Amit does, but I use half the uh, ECU rather right, than the yeah. whole ECU. Try, try to do the same thing and and uh, pass through the medullary canal out dorsally, and I yeah. try and uh, uh, weave it back into itself as tight as I can. Yeah, yeah. For everybody, uh, you guys, ha everyone needs to have their you know favorite way to stabilize these things, and whether it's uh, unfortunately there's lots of ones described and even um, some that aren't published that work really well. We know from Dr. Gupta here too, so. Um, uh, Janine, I think we have a, a question from the audience uh, for you. Uh, can you explain the primary difference between Munster and sugar tongue? I'd be happy to. So the, the Munster orthosis, um, uh, is there a way that I, could you mind if I share my screen to show it? Would that be terrible or? Uh... Sure, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to go out there and do that. So here we go. Um, and so the Munster, uh, here we go. Sorry. Okay. So the, the sugar tong is a piece of material that goes volar, wraps around the elbow, and ends up dorsal. And I think the the surgeons in the audience realize they do this with a plaster slab. It's a lot, it's floppy. It's where the Munster, um, this design is, is one piece of material with two tabs here. And you can position the patient, which is where you want them just like this. And gravity helps you. Here, gravity is not gonna help you because you're working in every, every direction. So the sugar tong actually looks like a tongs when it comes off the patient, where the Munster is simply um, this one piece. So I hope that that uh, answers the question. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Janine, you, you, the, you, you continue to be popular in the question. So uh, oh. uh, the, the next question is, can you share any favorite functional strengthening endurance exercises or activities for the post-op population uh, for these uh, surgeries? Well, I think it's more important to, to be pain-free than to say, hey, we've got, we've, we've got all this range of motion, we've got all this strength. Um, if, you have, if you have pain, no matter how much 
you won't have strength. So uh, getting them stable, getting them pain-free is going to be more important than, than starting a strengthening program. And the activities of daily living that individuals are doing um, is, is a lot. They, they need to do quite a bit. So um, I'm not going to do a lot of resisted pronation and supination at any time. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> so um, we, as, you, as we see these, uh, p these problems, the, these issues with individuals, strength um, well, if they're pain-free, they're going to naturally get their strength back with activities of daily living. So I, I hate to be negative on that one. <laughs> Great. Um, well, um, looks like we're caught up on questions at the moment. So are you guys okay if we go to a few more cases? We got a few minutes. Sure. Okay. Let me see if I can... Um... Uh, Dr. Gupta, did you want to share one in particular? Or do you sure. want me to go? Why, why didn't you show the uh, calamari? And uh, that'll be interesting. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just, um, is everybody off sharing? Oh, here we go. Sorry about that. If it's okay, I'm going to I'm gonna work into that one. I'll just do a minute or two of yeah. uh, sort of things that I'll save time to go over that as well. Hopefully you guys can all see that now. So um, I had pulled this out of my initial talk just a little bit. Uh, we didn't really talk about U heads too much. Um, they're not my favorite. I would just mention this was one that I did, and the lady we you know, had impaction, and at the time she did not have inflammatory. It seems like now, about 12 years later, she's converted to being seropositive, unfortunately, but um, she had a very flat sigmoid notch, and it makes putting in an implant a little tricky. Um, not quite sure why I didn't want to do a DARA for her, but this was a while ago. And the interesting thing I learned is I put the stem in, and you can see that it's it's really resorbed quite a bit. Um, it was not a really big ulna. And unfortunately, once I had that in, um, I really had trouble getting this stable. And I had to go to a very large U head, as you can see here, the diameter is quite large. But this was kind of akin to doing a radial head. If it's too small or something, you have certain problems, it's too big, you have other problems. Fortunately, with the larger head, she was stable. And you know, this is eight years later, and even on her lateral, she's nicely aligned. So um, I would say, I, hopefully it's not this long. I think this is probably a little oblique on the x-ray, but uh, her impaction was present, I think, before as well. So um, I hope that won't come loose. It's eight years out. She's pretty happy with it. Uh, just to round out our discussion a little bit about um, a, a U-head. Uh, I think we covered this kind of case. This was a Soterianus type that just didn't uh, work and was salvaged with an aptus. Uh, fortunately, that one's about 10 years out and doing pretty well. Um, one more thing I just wanted to mention, because I think this comes up a fair bit, is that sometimes you have somebody that comes in with arthritis, they have some pain, not too bad, but they come in because they, they have an EDQ rupture or something's off a little bit. This was the lady I presented earlier who we um, you know, had a talk with, and she said, you know, I really don't have that much trouble with my forearm. It's just this tendon issue. What do we what do? We do? And um, I, I'm curious what, you know, Phil and Emmett, what you might consider for this, because I... I at the time thought, well, how much more will a, a DAR really help her? She might converge more, I don't know. She really doesn't have a very symptomatic DRUJ aside from the problem that's being caused by this into the tendons. So we did, um, or I did at that time, we just talked, said, you know, we could explore it, see if we can get, a, you know, repair the capsule. It's not unstable, to, uh, as you can see, fortunately. And we just kind of did a tenolysis of the EDQ, left it outside, what was left of it, and left it alone. Um, and she's not been back to do anything. So I, I don't know how often you guys come across this type of a of a situation, but um, it was, um, you know, you wonder if you're underdoing it or are you supposed to go big or go home, but any comments? Um, I guess I'll comment. Uh... I do worry, particularly in the inflammatory arthritis population, which may not be the situation here, that uh, one tendon problem is likely to lead to other tendon problems. And my observation is that uh, I, I think it's a mechanical attritional rupture of the tendons from uh, bone, uh, either off the uh, sigmoid notch of the radius or off the ulnar head. And so uh, I, I'm usually going to do some type of bony operation in that area in addition. And I'm a little bit more surgically aggressive once I see one tendon problem because, um, you know, 
uh, EDM rupture is probably functionally not terribly limiting for most people. You add EDC five and EDC four, and then maybe three, and then you start to get into uh, you know uh, serious functional limitations for anybody. Yeah, agreed. So the, I would definitely say this is not my favorite thing to do. A little less we found that it was relatively round. We were able to take off an osteophyte and capsule, and it looked like a reasonable closure. And she was comfortable, you know, 75, we could monitor her. And uh, again, I'm not saying it's the best thing to do. It was just something we chose to do to try to limit her recovery, uh, which was fairly easy since we had just a limited arthrotomy. Okay. Um, we didn't really mention this, but of course, if you're into this severe inflammatory disease, we do need to make sure that we just remember that we really need to centralize the carpus and and then deal with the sigmoid notch. This was just an example where the distal ulna was a great bone graft for this radiocorporal arthrodesis. So just a quick picture there for if you're dealing with a very different animal than what we're talking about. Today was really mostly about osteoarthritis of the of the uh, DRUJ, but um, they don't always come in labeled so nicely into your clinic. So just keep an eye out. Um, I'm going to jump down to a case, and I would just preface this with this is a little bit on the maybe on the fringe a little bit, but one of my previous partners, uh, Dr. Bassam El Hassan, um, really kind of championed this idea, I think, and uh, Sanj Kakar and a few other folks have written it up, and I think that it's it's just an interesting way to think about a certain problem. Uh, we think about the instability that occurs by resecting the head and trying to get that back. And um, Bassam uh, shared this case with me, and I appreciate uh, him sharing it for, with all of us. Um, it, he, he really started doing this, and we learned from him to consider this at least as an option. So just put it in your, uh, maybe in your toolbox. So this is a patient who had some trouble with clicking, DRG arthritis, 60-year-old patient, having trouble with working out and playing. Um, you can see a little bit of DRG arthritis. It's not too bad. She's had a previous shortening, it looks like here as well. And the idea here was if you're going to do almost, if you think a little bit more like, um, almost like a Bowers where you're going to remove a bit of the head, uh, but, you know, what's going to allow you to be, if you put something in there, how can you stabilize that again? And if you think about even the CT I showed, if you do have that flat sigmoid notch, it's kind of like, well, it's going to slide. Why, how is it going to stay there? And I think uh, this technique really makes me think about things like when we would read about notch plasties for the sigmoid notch. I found that operation very hard to do, um, but the idea is that if you can think about this, if you can't really do a sigmoid notch plasty and move the bone, what if you turn it into something that maybe has a labrum like the shoulder, something that makes a deeper socket? And I think it's an interesting idea, including uh, for complicated DRJ problems after just a radius fracture sometimes, if you don't want to go all the way to resection, for example. So just to kind of expand your thinking a little bit. So. What Bassam did was um, said, well, we can take a lateral meniscus allograft and kind of make it uh, a donut or you know, what we always like to call it was a calamari. That was the, the thing. It's kind of like that. We, uh, he would curl it and then basically make a bit of a, a socket. And then this is going to we uh, he, his uh, earlier ones was with a pyrocarbon, a small MCP implant, just because you needed something to just replace the, the seed essentially of the ulnar head. And just an example of how that might fit. Here's that's just a snap on the MCP trial. And then basically you have your sigmoid notch exposed. You're basically putting a couple anchors in, and you're basically going to just put the calamari on the four sutures and slide it in. Um, so on a, the the face will be towards us. Here's the sutures going through, and then he has a nice picture here, telescoping it or just letting it slide on down in. And you tie it in, and you now have a little socket in there. And uh, it kind of disappears pretty quickly when you get it in there. But the idea being you now have some form of a inter interposition and also something that might be more of, con of a concave uh, implant rather than having, for example, if you have something like a Citerianus, you really have a convex implant in the middle that's really trying like a ball between chopsticks. It's not, it's not quite the same. Um, granted, in this case, you still have the distal ulna as well, so it's a little bit different. And then, um, so the ulna is uh, proximal here, excuse me, on the left side. And just for reference, just make sure that, so left is proximal, right is distal. And then we just uh, make a small implant uh, broaching for the uh, MCP. This is a press fit implant in this case. It's fit right in there. And then the capsule is repaired. 
interestingly, the thing I was always kind of um, critical about was, you know, how are you going to get enough capsule over all this or whatever? But um, Bossom's point, which I think was what I learned too, and I completely, you know, this is his his stuff. But um, when you get enough interposition in there or space, it's just like when you fix the coronal plane of a distal radius fracture. You've sort of retentioned the things at the distal end, and it, it can be pretty satisfying. Now, that doesn't mean they're all going to work, but it's an interesting thing where, you know, here you have a, um, you know, maybe you do a DARA here. It's awfully difficult to do an aptus here where you got to deal with the potential for other problems and getting through that medullary canal. So um, I thank him for sharing it and for really coming up with it and having the, you know, going out there and doing it. He shared it with us. We've, uh, not everybody's a believer, but I think it's an interesting idea. And um, I think it's something to, you know, have in, the, in your back pocket. And I would keep it in mind. I've constantly tried to find the right sigmoid notch problem at some point, maybe where we can, re, you know, um, as a, maybe it's a, a step to um, some form of a sigmoid notch plasty in the future. Um, and it's not bony, which is nice. So um, any comment? Otherwise, I think I'm going to, that's probably my last uh, real case I was going to show there. Any questions on that or comments? Um, again, I have no, um, not attached to that at all. I just appreciate it. And he was kind enough to share his slide. So thanks again to Dr. Ellison. Well, thanks very much, David, for sharing this um, interesting concept. Um, Yeah, just something that kind of, I wouldn't say that as AO, we want to say, yes, you should go home and take out, a, go find a lateral meniscus and start putting these in everybody. But, you know, sometimes uh, the sixth time going back in or something is hard. I do think that I was going to just revisit. I think that, um, you know, those who have not trained in a lot of orthoplasty at the DRUJ may not venture into it as easily. But I think Dr. Blazer's comment about should we be doing some of these more as a primary treatment? Um, I was sort of thought, taught that why don't you try the simple thing that may not go south first and then see if you need to do something else. But I think it's it's good to keep our mind open. And having had uh, Louis visit us a few times and go through this in the lab really did help me to become comfortable with the idea of, a, of an implant. And I think um, for those who maybe haven't had a chance to do this, find a lab and find a, a time to, to, to try these things and just be comfortable with them. So... I think uh, we're getting kind of close on time. Were there any other, i just like to not be the only one speaking here. Phil and, and Janine, I really appreciate all your time. And are there any comments or or, or um, other questions? I'll, I'll stop sharing here. I can't thank you all enough for your time and effort and your cases and the decades of um, clinic time and surgical time that was in all those talks. <laughs> thank so, you very much for uh, inviting us to uh, come to this uh, webinar. I've enjoyed this. And uh, uh, for myself, I'd say thank you. Thank you for attending. Absolutely. Privileged to be here and learn from everybody and the uh, audience with some great questions. So uh, thanks to AO and Dave for you doing the heavy lifting. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, it's been great to be a part of it. And uh, these are challenging cases. So thank you for all you do to help these individuals.